And I'm going to hand over now to our chair for this evening, uh, the Director of Curly Action, Mary Colwell. Thank you, Ellen. Good evening, everybody. So nice that you could join us tonight, especially just before Easter. Um, it is a subject which is so incredibly important, uh, curlews and silage, as you know from the discussion we started to have last time. And we'll carry on. We, did, we ran out of time for questions and answers and any in-depth discussion. So this is the point of tonight. Uh, I'm not going to go on very much. I hope we'll do this in an hour so that everybody start their Easter. But just to give you a little bit of background, uh, silage is a way of feeding cows uh, through the winter. So farmers have to have feed for their cattle. And that's uh, now produced by multiply cutting grass in fields through the sort of spring and summer months and then storing that gas, the, the grass so that the cows can be fed. Um, it's uh, it's a very efficient way of feeding cows, but it's also very damaging to birds that are trying to nest in those fields. So the big question is, we know curlews fall foul to silage. We do know that for sure. Uh, and so the question tonight is, can we have silage and curlews? Um, I was actually having a quick look on the internet before we started. I was sort of labouring under the misapprehension that we all are all drinking so much more milk and eating so much more beef. Actually, that's not true. Milk consumption has fallen by half since 1974. So we're drinking a lot less uh, liquid milk, but we're eating far more cheese, far more cheese. Uh, and the amount of beef we're consuming is kind of... Uh, sort of levelish but slowly declining. So, uh, but we do have big exports of both beef and dairy. So these are still hugely important parts of our economy. So if we are going to hold on to the beautiful curlew, we have to find ways to get them to live safely in the farmed environment on cattle and beef farms. So without further ado, I can't think of three better people actually to help trial and ravel some of the complexities of curlies and silage. Uh, we have uh, Pete Webster, who is a dairy farmer up in the north in Yorkshire, and uh, he does face the sort of the real problems of trying to cut silage to feed his dairy herd, but also is a real supporter of ground nesting birds and loves curlews on his land. And Pete has been in touch with us at the Curlew Recovery Partnership and Curlew Action quite a lot. Uh, recently and is a great supporter of what we're doing. We have Mike Smart, who is um, a, a Curlew Action trustee and an old friend of mine. And Mike is a very experienced field worker working in the lowlands on curlews and comes across the effect of silage cutting uh, on the birds he's monitoring. And we also have Rebecca Pringle uh, from Natural England, who is actively involved in trying to get together the right prescriptions in elms uh, so to help farmers do the right thing for curlews and other ground nesting birds. So I think you'll agree we have a really cracking panel. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Pete for our first for our first little introduction. Each speaker's got about five to seven minutes um, to explain who they are and how they position themselves, you know, what, how they see this issue. Uh, and we'll go with Pete first, Mike second, Rebecca third. So over to you, Pete. Thanks, Mary. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's a, a real honour to be asked to speak with you this evening and to hopefully have a, a positive discussion um, around a topic which, um, you know, causes great debate and, um, you know, it takes a lot of uh, time, my thought process, mulling over the, the balance between uh, commercial farming practices and uh, essentially nature conservation. Um, on the farm. So yeah, we're based here in the east of the Forest of Boland ANOB. Uh, we're in York, North Yorkshire, uh, near the, the market town of Settle. Um, I'm a spring bra uh, grazing dairy farm, which essentially means that we, we carve all our cows over a 12 week period in the spring. And we use the grass uh, that we grow on the farm as best as possible to produce um, very good quality, high in fat, um, and, and protein milk. Uh, we're milking just around 200 cows and we have some sheep as well. Uh, the farm is about 170 hectares, ranging from uh, very good productive meadowland to some really uh, species rich uh, habitat that we have triple SI, uh, and we have a lot of wetland and uh, you know there's an awful lot of botanical interest as well as bird interest. Um, 
the field I'm studying here, this is one of our silage meadows, as we would class it. And if I pan around, you can see some more silage meadows there in the, in the background. Um, and then down in the bottom here, we've got some wetland. Now, silage being the topic of conversation tonight um, leads me on to the fact that these meadows also provide a home to the curlews. This particular field we're in here annually has a, a pair of, of breeding curlews, uh, as do many of our meadows um, and the wetland also. And it's, a, it's an annual problem and an annual headache for me. How do we best fit with the curlews uh, and also um, uh, get, a, get a viable um, cut of silage or, or in our case, two to three cuts of silage to feed our, our herd of, of dairy cows. So in the slides, you can see here, these are just some of the images we've taken from the farm. Um, annually, we find uh, many nests on the farm and we're really fortunate that we, we managed to get um, young fledged most years, um, although it's becoming a bigger challenge for, for more reasons than just silage, and we may touch on some of those later. Uh, and Ellen, if you'd be as good as to hover on the link uh, on, the, on this slide to the, the Instagram page. If I'm quiet, you may well be able to hear um, curlews, but possibly not. So in this, this image here, this is basically taken last week uh, on our farm. That's the, some, uh, the wetland, the triple SI. And you can see as well as the dairy cows, we also have a, a herd of belted galloways that do some uh, habitat grazing. Um, and we're fortunate enough to have um, four, four of the main waders on the farm. So we have snipe, um, uh, oyster catcher, lapwing, as well as the curlews. Um, so these guys create some fantastic habitat for that. And the next slide again, please, Ellen. You'll see that modern farming practices are, you know, we've moved on an awful lot in the way in which um, silaging and, and, and cutting of grass and grow, even growing of grass has, has changed over the, the last kind of 10, 20, 30 decades, really. No, sorry, years, two or three decades. Um, and the machinery now is becoming bigger and faster. And we are kind of, we're on this treadmill that we, that we, or the conveyor belt that we can't really get off. We have to move, or we feel as if we have to move with the, the machinery manufacturers because the contractors that we use move with them. Um, and this is a real conundrum for me. You know, how do we, where do we go from here? Do we continue farming in the, in, you know, with the same contractors in the way in which we have been for the last five or 10 years, or do we, you know, and they're going to continue to get better, uh, bigger, um, or do we, you know, do we take stock and, and do, is there, a, is there another better way that's better possibly for, to protect the curlews during harvest time? Um, you know, when it, when it comes to that process of actually gathering the grass and ensiling it. Um, one of the main issues with growing the silage crop is, is also finding the curlews. So we spend hours trying to find either the nests or the chicks. You know, we're talking about grass that could be, you know, um, uh, 40 or 50 centimetres high. It's, it's really difficult to find these birds. Um, but that's something we do endeavour to try and do each year. So that's a little bit about me. I will pass you on to uh, to Mike now and um, we'll continue the discussion later. Thank you. Thanks ever so much. Before you disappeared, actually, I'd, I'd like to, um, now you're back, sort of bigger picture. If you could just show us where you are again, Pete, because it's really, uh, really interesting for you just to pan the camera around to give us the reality of the size of the fields we're talking about. <laughs> I mean, so absolutely huge, aren't they? I don't know. I, I don't know if you can see in the background here. We have this is Ingleborough, one of the three peaks of North Yorkshire. Um, this is our triple SI down in the bottom here, and we pan right round. Um, and there's more wetland down here where the belties are growing at the moment, and we're planning on doing um, some wet, wetland creation later this summer. We this is heading. Uh, this is looking west onto the uh, the forest of Boland. ANOB. Um, these are some of our meadows down the bottom and our higher ground up on the top here, right up on the horizon. And if we keep panning around, um, the farm sits just over the hill here. So these are fairly big meadows. This one I'm in at the moment is 15 acres. Um, and the, the next one over is 15 as well. Um, so we, we cut um, approximately 120 acres uh, two to three times a year for our silage crop. 
And you have actually got curlews in there at the moment, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, there's a pair of curlews in here. Well, they're actually floating between this field and the next one over. Um, and the wetland behind me, there's there's definitely two pairs on there on two different uh, parts of that. There's also a couple of pairs of lapwings there. The wetland behind me over here with the, the belt of galloways, there's two pairs on there at the moment, again, trying to find a, a nest. And there's several pairs of lapwings there. So it's looking like we're going to be on target for our usual uh, pairs with kind of working between five and eight pairs per yeah. year of, of curlews and, and anywhere up to kind of a dozen or 15 pairs of lapwings and uh, numerous snipe. So I can see your issue. I mean, how you find a nest and even more how you find little chicks in that yeah. is, is <laughs> quite a challenge, I would say. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's far more of a challenge in a silage meadow like this rather than a pasture field that the cattle or sheep are grazing in. B because essentially what we do is we, we shut these fields up for six weeks to allow the crop to grow and then we harvest it and then we shut it up for another six weeks and, and repeat the process. So last year we actually had a, a, a nest in the middle of the field here and uh, the, the chicks uh, hatched literally the day before we, we decided we were going to mow the field. And so we left about an acre, maybe an acre and a half of the field unmown um, for the chicks to, to run around in, I suppose, and, you know, feed. And we're pretty confident we managed to, to leave them unscathed um, whilst we harvested that crop over the next kind of 24, 36 hours. Um, and we're, we're pretty certain there's a, a couple fledged from that nest. Um, but I mean, it's, it's uh, as I say, it's a real conundrum how to deal with it. It's... Um, I think I actually, I, I gave you a, a, an SOS phone call last year, Mary, or maybe it was even to Russ at Curly uh, uh, Action and um, just saying, you know, what is your advice? Can we move the nest? Can we, you know, can we can we take the eggs out and, and then reposition them after after we've mown? And, you know, we, there needs to be a bit of a long term solution to this um, because, there are, you know, there are many farmers that do care for these birds as much as I do. And, oh, yeah. you know, we'd we'd like to see you know some sort of long-term solution uh, because farming practices aren't aren't really going to um change you know it, you know the world has changed an awful lot over the last 20 or 30 years and farming practices being one and so we just need to try and make sure the two can still work in harmony with each other really yeah i, I absolutely and that that is exactly what we're all trying to work towards and you know when you did get in touch with us a, a year or so ago now and said help because I really, really have to. I mean, it wasn't, you, you had to, you were under contract. You have to provide milk to a dairy. So you can't just sort of say, oh, well, I won't bother this year. Um, and, and yet the birds are depending on you for safety. So it is a, a, a really difficult situation for you, I would say. It is, yeah. I mean, you know, I am a dairy farmer. This is my chosen profession. You know, we are, we're a professional industry. We're, we're a business, we have to make profit. You know, there's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, however, you know, I am not a, a ruthless person. I don't think the industry is ruthless. I think we want to do our best to try and work with nature. Um, you know, we're, we're in a, a mid-tier uh, mid environmental scheme here, um, countryside stewardship scheme. We, you know, we're, through various other grant schemes, we're, as I say, we're putting in reed beds to kind of help with water quality. We're putting in um, a, a lowland um, kind of water bodies for the wading birds for, for spring and summertime. You know, there's all sorts of different bits of work we're trying to do to, to enhance the nature and, and, and the wildlife that we have here. Thanks, Pete. Uh, it's a really good. And thank you for being in the field to give us a sense of, of so, the reality on the ground. I don't know if okay. you can pick up on it, but there are curlews all around at the moment, actually. But, uh, are they calling? I can't yeah, they are, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, at you. Anyway. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. Okay. okay, so our next speaker is Mike Smart, as I said, a trustee of Curlew Action, but also a, a, an absolutely so experienced in the field. I don't think there's many people who have worked on curlews for as long in, as dedica in a dedicated way as Mike has in Gloucestershire, in the lowland uh, meadows there. So um, over to you, Mike. Uh, first of all, though, just before you, we get to your slides, just give us a very brief, if you will, history of curlews in your parts of the world um, because I know that there was something you wanted to explain about how they've kind of moved down to the lowlands and now are dependent on the lowlands. 
Right. Thank you, Mary. Um, yes, I'm talking about curlews in the floodplain of the Severn and the River Avon in Gloucestershire and Worcestershire. And uh, this is now the stronghold of curlews in um, our part of the world, uh, these lowland flood floodplains. But this is uh, something that's occurred in the last hundred years, say, because in the early uh, in the early 20th century, around 1920, 1930, uh, there were still lots of curlews on the higher ground, uh, on the Cotswolds or on higher ground in, in Worcestershire. And, but with the intensification of agriculture um, the, the, uh, and, and replacement of sheep grazing by cereal production, there was, um, it, it was just too intensive. Uh, for for the curlews, so we are now where there used to be curlews up on the Cotswolds uh, in large numbers. There are incredibly few, very very uh, and and the, the very very important to try and look after the small numbers that that remain. But our main focus um, now is down in the floodplain. Thank you, Mike. Okay, so we go on with your presentation. Uh, yes, so this is a map um, of uh, the uh, Severn and Avon floodplains with the uh, spots showing places where curlews uh, are uh, trying to nest. And you'll see the, the one that goes up to the top left is the Severn, the one that goes off a diagonal to the top right is the Avon, and then the, the two join at Chooksbury and further down the Severn there are more um, uh, that there are more sites continuing the line down there. So the, the very, these birds are very much concentrated in, in the meadows of the Severn and, and the Avon floodplains as shown here. Next one, Annie. And this, this is a picture taken only about a fortnight ago. Uh, we've had um, huge rain, as everybody knows, all through March. This would normally be a meadow. This is what one of our major sites looks like now. It's completely under underwater. Normally, there would be curlews gathering on uh, on this, preparing to breed. We would expect them to start nesting in about the middle of uh, uh, April, when we usually find the first eggs. So right now, it's it's literally. It, it really is a floodplain underwater. Next one. Here's another site. This is one of our biggest sites at Upper Meadow. And this is looking from high ground across the, right across the meadow. Uh, you can judge by how things have changed. Instead of curlews on the meadow, we've had great crested grebes uh, displaying and trying to nest on, on, on that wa water out there where and this, this is a picture taken in February, so uh, it does show you just how wet these places are in, in the winter and well into spring sometimes. Next. Here's a picture of the same, uh, at the same site. Uh, in, this is in May and June in a normal year. It shows some of the um, typical um, floodplain vegetation that's narrow leaf water drop work which is a great speciality around here and that um, th that grows uh, in the meadows uh, and mixed in with the grass before the, um, the the haze cut next next here's here's a typical curlew's nest uh, as um, as was shown previously uh, big eggs uh, in very deep uh, thick grass, really hard to find. You have to find them early in the season, uh, otherwise they're just too hard to find. Next one, please. Right, so I'm afraid going on to text a bit, and, and what happens is that these river, riverside meadows are so damp, you can't make uh, hay before about mid-June, and you can't make very much else um, you can't do anything else with them because they are so wet. And all the farmers around us emphasize that the, uh, er, the earlier, the better, as far as they're concerned, is hay cut 
is best for hay cutting because the hay loses its nutritional value if you leave it for too long. Once upon a time, haymaking would have begun uh, in mid-June and continued till September. And maybe some there, there wouldn't have been resources to cut some of the hay. But with rapid modern tractors, as has already been said in Yorkshire, even the largest fields can be cut in a day or two. But there are some ancient Lammas meadows. Lammas day is loaf mass day, the day in early August when you bring your first loaf to church for harvest festival. And these are uh, still, the Lammas meadows are, uh, are still distributed in long thin strips, which are cut by the um, individual owners. And the last ones are cut in Lammas day in early August. Next one, please. And so the Lammas meadows uh, are, are obviously best for curlews since it risks the reduce of accidents uh, of, of curlews being uh, either the eggs being destroyed or the young being destroyed. And it leaves refuge areas for, the, for adults and chicks. Most a lot of these the meadows in our area uh, are under some kind of stewardship scheme organized by Natural England and they encourage farmers to cut their hay as late as possible. Some of the oldest, uh, oldest schemes uh, allow cutting from mid-June nowadays. The newer ones are often allow cutting way, way well into July. And even so, there are accidents with uh, um, even in the, in the best organized meadows. Sometimes eggs are, are, are crushed uh, or particularly if it's a late or a second a, a late clutch to replace one that was lost earlier. And the problem is that curlew chicks tend to burrow into the grass. They lie doggo, they don't run away. So they may be hit by, by machinery. And quite a lot of conservation groups in the lowlands, we have a wild fowl and wetlands trust uh, project in the Seven and Avons that I'm working with. And we obviously therefore aim to establish the closest possible relation, relationship with farmers. Without the, these farming methods, which have gone on for a long time, there wouldn't be any curlew. So the curlews are totally dependent on the farmers. Next one. The problem is that chick, uh, is chick productivity. The real, the real, the main reason for this sharp decline in curlews, which has been found out all over Europe, is the low number of chicks produced. Two of the causes for this low productivity are habitat loss and predation. Third ca cause is loss of eggs through agricultural activities, especially early mowing. And even in areas with late hay cuts, despite the best ever efforts of conservation projects and farmers, productivity remains obstinately low. And so the crucial thing uh, in, in our area and in other lowland areas in southern England, in places like the Thames Valley or, or um, the Somerset levels, the, the essential thing is to find much stronger, much more generous system systems to reward farmers who look after their curlews. It's a very urgent national priority. Next one. That's what we're trying to produce. There, there are three very young curlews, only just out of the nest. Uh, they uh, only about um, probably 24 hours old, though, those birds. They come out of the egg, dry out uh, and look uh, gorgeous like that. And then we'll be moving, um, uh, running round, able to feed themselves. You see that yeah, they don't have the long, uh, down curve bill, typical of, of, of adult curlews. So they're picking on the surface for insects in, in the grass. Uh, and uh, that's when uh, the danger to them occurs. Uh, uh, if if the, um, the haymaking ma machinery hits them. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. So the things that I got from your presentation are that um, in the areas that you work in, uh, you're quite lucky in many ways. And some of the areas you work in, lucky in the sense that the farmers there are have to cut their grass late because the ground's so wet, they can't do it earlier, which does give the at least the curlews in those areas a chance to survive. Um, and secondly, um, how challenging it is 
for you and other the people that you work with to actually find and identify the nests and chicks as the grass grows so quickly in these lowland areas is that a fair summary um yes to which i would I, I i would add um we try very hard to work closely with the farmers who as peter's already said are um, to a man to a woman very keen on their on on their curlews anxious to do the best for them but they they do have to cut cut their hay so if if we can identify the nests early on uh, find the places where the nests are and and uh, perhaps show them where they might leave a bit a bit uncut that's the that's the best way out but it it does need government support uh, for these farmers um, so that they can um, they can carry on their, their 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 farming and not destroy the curlews. It's government support for sure, but it's also having skilled people like you, Dan and Kane, to actually go and work with the farmers and find the nest, and that's a limiting factor as well, isn't it? Yeah, sure. Is that something you think that you it's easy for you to train people up to do? Is that something that that Curly Action say could set up a training scheme or the Curly Recovery Partnership. Well, as as you know, there um, it, there are little groups uh, right across Lowland England who are working uh, in their own uh, local areas to try and uh, and conserve curlews, and there's a terrific force of of volunteers of curly. Curlew fans, curlew fanatics, you might say almost, um, who who really want want to help the farmers, um, and there are organized over the last five years, I would say, um, there have been organized groups that, that have grown up and and are trying to do things always in close cooperation with fa with farmers, um, and uh, so there certainly is a movement to, to do things um, with, with a lot of volun voluntary help, but it, it varies from place to place as, as, as to just how, how good the organization is. Okay, thanks, Mike. That's a, a nice overview of, so we've had a, a picture from up in North Yorkshire. We've had a picture from down in Gloucestershire. And I think then we'll move on to Rebecca because all eyes are on you, Rebecca, really. We've no pressure yeah. at all. Yeah, I've heard from pressure. Pete and from Mike, <laughs> Pete and Mike that you know, with the best will in the world, uh, farmers have a job to do, and um, and but they and but they and they want to do the right thing. But sometimes I think the compensation isn't attractive enough, or I think as we'll probably discover, the schemes are quite complicated for many people to get into. So. I'll ask you to to give your little presentation and then and hear from you about where you see Natural England fitting into the scenarios that you've just heard. Rebecca's frozen. Have you frozen, Rebecca? Or was it frozen with fear, what I've just said? <laughs> While we're unfreezing, Rebecca, can I ask you if uh, the audience, if you do have any questions for Mike or for Pete, um, please put them in the chat and we'll collate them and get onto them soon. Rebecca's very frozen at the moment. So why don't we just go on to a couple of the questions that have popped up while we're waiting for Rebecca to come back. Um, let me have a look. I just Hi, seen Rebecca. one. So, oh, you're back again. Can you hear? Yay. There you go. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, we're lost again. Let's answer this question. This question from David in the chat and it's directed at Pete, I think. How big were the fields 40 years ago, Pete, before silage production uh, overtook hay? Do you have the history of your farm, in other words? Yeah, um, this, this field, and we're actually in here, there's two, two fields here uh, side by side, and they actually haven't changed an awful lot in size. Uh, there are other ones in the fields that 
we'll be, you know, the average field size on this farm is about six, six to seven acres. Uh, yeah, 40 years ago, they'd have probably been half that. Um, the, the farm is actually kind of, kind of split into two. Um, so what is more the, the, the dairy, what we call a dairy platform, um, it is that sort of six or seven acre size. Uh, the, the upland block, um, they're, they're much smaller. They're, they are still kind of three to four acres in size. Um, yeah, and, and as I say, 40 years ago, they'd have probably been half that. So our fields probably haven't changed in size as much as uh, other parts of the country. The reason being is um, if I spin the camera around, you can see that our field boundaries are stone walls. I don't know if you can see, but these are all dry stone walls all the way around the field. If you can see into the horizon, they're, um, they're all stone walls. So unlike, unlike a hedge that can quite easily cut out uh, and ploughed through, uh, that, that's less easy with, um, um, Mary, with, a, with a stone wall. Uh, and so that's why the, the field sizes haven't probably altered as much here as they have in other Brilliant. parts of the country. Uh, sorry about that. My internet has cut off. Thank you, um, Pete. If we could do another thumbs up that you can hear me and then I'll try and continue. Is that OK? I can, I can hear you. Can you hear me, Rebecca? I can't actually hear anyone. Uh, ah, so OK. Sorry about that. OK, why don't you give your presentation? OK, well, I'll just yeah. start speaking and we'll see. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that was we said about uh, a lot of pressure and obviously it was too much pressure for my Internet. And they just <laughs> uh, conked out. Um, so I'll send uh, Virgin uh, some words. Um, so, yeah, I'm Rebecca Pringle. I'm a, a senior specialist in, in Natural England um, and in the Ornithology team. Um, along with sort of 20 or so other people. Um, my journey into to Natural England started um, a while ago now and, and sort of inspired by seeing HLS farms um, actually doing something for, for farmland birds, things like yellow wagtail and, um, and skylark. Um, I started off by um, being a protected sites and agri-environment scheme advisor, um, going out working with land managers in, in Oxfordshire and, and Buckinghamshire. Um, and have worked with with farmers in the Upmore Basin um, and Burnwood, northeast of Oxford, um, for waders, things like creating scrapes for for curlew. Um, my role now is um, working with with Defra to develop the new um, elm scheme. Um, I've got an overview of the the scheme in terms of of birds and making sure we have the right options and and management um, for them. And it was great to hear. Um, on the webinar uh, last time that the positive things that Russ had to say about working with uh, Natural England successfully, which um, very much hope will continue. Um, and it's been really valuable to, to hear from Russ and, and Mary as well about, um, and I'd give them a chance to question Natural England about what is possible when um, developing um, options and, and amending them. Um, and I really uh, appreciated meeting Pete uh, from the panel last week to, to hear those first hand experiences and, and test them about thinking. So thank, thank you, Pete. Um, with the, the current scheme, I mean, I don't have any uh, slides to share, and, um, but if, it's, if it is useful, then um, I've got a couple that give a bit of a summary of what is available currently for, for Curly that I can, I can send to Ellen. Um, there, there are various things that are available at the moment. So in grassland, there's the wet grassland um, for breeding waders. And we also have hay meadows in, in places that, that Mike described and also the upper, upper Thames um, tributaries, which is one of the priority areas for, for CRP. There's also um, options for, for moorland areas and sort of gr rough uh, grazing areas and um, things like the scrape creation that I mentioned earlier. Um, we've also used a, um, a threatened species uh, supplement, um, which can be used for management that goes above and beyond that the usual um, habitat option uh, to fund um, hay sacrifice, um, so hay making sacrifice on um, one of the national nature reserves in Yorkshire. But I guess we're talking about silage, so so where does silage fit into this? And I recognise that there are, have been fewer opportunities to incorporate um, some of the nature friendly options that we've talked about into that silage system. I think potentially smaller profit margins in some cases, giving less uh, chance and le less opportunities to, to free up those pieces of land. And I think Mary, uh, sorry, Mandy described very well um, 
why those silage fields and, and peat did it on why they're so appealing to curlew sort of being undisturbed from um, from mm. people and from livestock um so we have supported crop sacrifice in in high hay meadows so why can't we do it for for silage too and uh, we are working up uh, working this up to see if um if it is uh, possible to to pay farmers to delay cutting or to leave areas uncut for for silage or haylage to to hopefully improve those chances of uh, of chicks fledging and the work that um that crp will be doing through the species recovery project will certainly help to confirm what areas are needed how big they are so that the guidance and advice that that we can give will be more accurate um, for natural england i guess the the key dilemmas that I see us needing to solve uh, uh, what level of funding is is needed um, to give an incentive enough um, for silage farmers to, to leave areas uncut. What are those knock on impacts of those actions? Anything from sort of the long term future of those crops and the, the profitability of them to to potentially business models if if you're changing the way that your your farming practices. Um, what sizes and shapes of areas as i mentioned are needed but then also how do we ensure that there is enough foraging habitat and shelter from predators in that wider landscape so some of the examples were having sort of a square of um of, of uncut uh, silage but that obviously leaves them very vulnerable to, to predation um so one i guess on predation it's i guess the elephant in the room um I do recognise what's said about um, predator control. Um, when the um, prospectus for, for elms was published in January um, of this year, it did state that um, that DEFRA were going to be looking at sort of tailored management, which included uh, managing predatory species, which uh, threaten um, threatened species uh, recovery or recovery of those threatened species. And we are looking into into this uh, seriously because we do recognise that it is uh, an issue that that people are, are continuing to face. And I know that um, that Mandy had mentioned last week, sort of those a couple of weeks ago, the the fact that you can do all of these things for 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 um, for curlew, but then they still get predated. So I guess I do have that that recognition that it is an issue. Um, I'll leave it there. Um, hopefully that has been a useful sort of whirlwind. Um, but yeah, really look forward to sort of hearing the discussion and, and sort of answering uh, questions. Um, I'll stop there and I'm going to make sure that I can actually hear them uh, when the time comes as well. Sorry. For, you let me, for if you could. Me. Thanks, Rebecca. If you can let me know if you can hear me, just a thumbs up or something, that would be great. Can you hear anything at the moment? Just to say, Mary, I can't hear you, so I'm going to try and reconnect to my laptop. OK, um, OK. Yeah, sorry, bear with me. OK, thank you. Uh, so out of what Rebecca has just said, um, for those who don't know, the, the, the Species Recovery Project, which Rebecca mentioned, is something that the uh, Curly Recovery Partnership has uh, been agreed, has agreed with Natural England. It's a, a a big project where we're being paid to oversee some testing and trialling of different farming regimes for curlew in the lowlands and in the uplands. Different cutting regimes, different ways of compensating farmers, uh, fencing, all kinds of things are going to be tested um, and we'll be starting that imminently and that was agreed just a couple of weeks ago so it's big news for the CRP uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll provide really useful information for Natural England with Elms going forward. But I am very aware, and I'm sure a lot of people on this call are very aware, oh, we need more research, we need more data, we need more time to work out what's what. And yet, if you speak to Mike and to Pete, I think they'd say, well, actually, I know what the problem is. I just need to be able to have the mechanism to deal with it. Uh, Pete, can I ask you to respond to that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean... As, as harsh as it sounds, um, you know, as I said, we're trying to run a profitable business here. Um, and it, by me leaving uh, large areas, you're actually very, uh, the wind noise is quite high, Pete. Sorry. Is it, yeah, oh, that's better. Is that better? Is that better? Yeah, Sorry. That's better. Yeah. 
sorry, as harsh as it sounds, you know, I'm running, I'm trying to run a profitable farming business here, and um, by by me leaving large areas of of fields unmown, uh, it, it has a negative impact on the financial performance of my business. Now, at the moment, I I'm choosing to to do that wherever possible. Um, because I want to try my best for the curlews. Um, however, if this is to be rolled out across the country and to get, you know, as many farmers on board as possible, we're not just talking dairy farmers, we're talking beef and sheep farmers as well. Um, then some sort of financial incentive will have to be offered because, you know, these businesses, a lot of them are, um, you know, are finding th at times pretty tough at the moment. Um, and with changes uh, in ag agricultural policy, uh, brought on from the, the, by the government, they're going to find things an awful lot tougher over the next few years as well. I think you'll find that a lot of farmers do care passionately about the the, the environment that they're working in and farming with, and they do care passionately about you know the nature that they find in their farms. It just really does come down to the financial side of things at the end of it. You know, they they're they're trying to they're trying to run a profitable business and and you know that may be one of the reasons why they put a mower into a field you know even though they might know there's a curly in there rather than than not um now we could what go what would you, you want you know, rebecca to do pete what would you want rebecca to give her give her a, a, a to do on monday morning yeah i, I mean <laughs> i i would like to see there be a prescription and, and I'm not necessarily saying linked to an agri-environment scheme because not all farmers want to be in an agri-environment scheme, but a, a standalone prescription that um, that would pay farmers for for not mowing parts of their field and and, and um, protect it, protecting areas where these curlew nest sites are. Um, that is what what I would want. That's what I think a, a lot of other farmers would want, and they, you know that way they would be giving it their, you know their best shot at trying to protect them. I think so that's a really interesting. Fine. Sorry, Pete. That's a really interesting point because we do know uh, that we don't have that many curlews in lowland England. They're you're not compared to the uplands. They're very thinly spread, to be honest. So we're probably not talking about a huge amount of of area that uh, you know that needs compensating for. Is that a possibility, Rebecca? I think um, the way that uh, schemes are designed is obviously to to promote. A, a more sort of holistic view of of farming system and, and to to try and bring as many different elements of of biodiversity farming into things. So I think that's why historically there has been sort of a scheme and you have a sort of a package of measures that are going towards a particular species or particular groups of species. Um, I think what we're trying to do is challenge the system a bit more to see how we can be more flexible uh, with that to see if we can have things that are more standalone even if it is within a scheme so I'd say uh, never say never um, but it, yeah it's something I, I, I think I, we are trying to be more ambitious with it so I, I'm hopeful that we can have something that, that does reward farmers um, I think one of the main things that that I need uh, is is those real world examples and real life examples so that we can really ensure that we are paying or work out what, what we need to pay uh, to reward farmers um, considering sort of their income foregone uh, costs. Pete, does it have to be money? Can you be paid and compensated in silage loss? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that would work that, that for sure, yeah. Um might be a little bit more complex to work out because we'd be talking about quality, you know, the silage and the silage, there's hay and there's hay, you know, it's, um, and especially based around a, a, a dairy business, you know, um, the silage is is highly important, uh, you know, in terms of milk production and quality and, and amount of milk production. So, um, so yeah, but that, that certainly could be something worked out, I'm sure. Um, there could be dialogue around that, yeah. Um, it's... I understand absolutely what Rebecca is suggesting, you know, and how the natural England like to have, um, you know, the likes of the mid-tier schemes, which is a whole farm approach or a higher level scheme, you know, uh, and pulling in certain elements of, the, you know, fr from throughout the farm. I just think if, if we were to go down that avenue, then that would, you know, that would um, 
alienate, or maybe not alienate is the right word, but it would certainly exclude an awful lot of farmers that don't necessarily want to be involved in a whole farm approach on various other things, um, but they do want to protect the curlews. Um, so that's where I feel as if a standalone payment um, or a standalone prescription um, is what's needed on, on, you know, on this matter. Thank you. We know from Mike, from Mike's presentation, that uh, curlews that are in the old fashioned hay meadows, cut late, left in strips quite often, as in Lammas meadows are. I've been out in the field with Mike, I've seen what it looks like. Uh, cut areas where we've seen the birds come out and feed, but they can scuttle back into the longer areas um, for safety. Uh, that's sort of the old fashioned way of farming, if you like. Uh, we know that works. Mike works on the birds where it does work. Can't you do that, Pete? <laughs> uh, it'd, it'd be nice to say we could. Um, I, I mean, it, the reality of the situation is that that's, that's not the modern world we live in. That's not the profitable world we live in. That's, you know, we, we, whether you like it or not, you know, <laughs> we, large parts of this country are used for food production. And much like all industry, uh, you know, agriculture has, has gone through a huge change over the last 40 or 50 years. You know, mechanisation um, has just, you know, escalated at a phenomenal rate. You know, you don't even need a driver to drive the tractors now. You, know, you do it through GPS and auto steer and things like this. You know, I can remember when I was growing up, I mean, 30 years ago, we used to have a, a, a mower that went on the back of the tractor that was five foot six in width. Um, the mowers now that come and mow this farm will be 20 foot in width, and some of them will be 30 foot and, and, and upwards. You know, so uh, the likes of this farm that's, you know, we mow 120 acres, I mean, that can literally be mown in eight or nine hours. You know, so the, the time in which it takes to cut the grass is just a fraction of what it used to be. And it's just the way of the world. I mean, you know, times have moved on. Um, it, it, all, it all comes down to time is money. And, and you, you know, if, if we were to, I mean, we wouldn't, we'd struggle to find a contractor to do it the old fashioned way. And it just wouldn't stack up financially, which is a really sad thing to say, really, really sad thing to say. Um, uh, but I mean, I could quite happily live with where we are at the moment in terms of our harvesting uh, procedure. We could possibly scale back from it a little bit and, you know, instruct the contractors to mow fields in certain ways that are more favourable. If there are chicks running around, we can push them out to the edges. Um, there's certainly things like that we can do. I'm not too fussed about moving on at speed from here. You know, we mow the we mow the grass and we we har pick it up and harvest it in what I would say at the moment is a, a you know considerably fast time, probably too fast for some, but I don't want to get any faster. You know, and so I could quite happily say right, this is where we want to be at. But it, you know, that's just I'm one voice, and the agricultural industry and the engineers, the agricultural engineers, they're making bigger and faster machines all the time. So. It's a real, you know, it's a real issue as to where we go from here. So how do your farmers, Mike, how do they put bread on the table every day then if they this old fashioned way of farming? Well, uh, it, it's only some of the farmers that we're talking about uh, who are using the old fashioned Lammas Meadow technique. Uh, a lot of the others uh, are, are doing the same sort of thing that Pete's talking, talking about. Um, and I would go back to to what I said before. There are about the only curlews that are surviving in our areas of southern England are in these hay meadows. If we want to maintain any curlews at all there, you've got to do something to look after these, these hay meadows. As CRP has shown, there are probably less than 500 pairs of curlews south of Birmingham. That's a st statistic we've used a lot. Um, and there aren't that many fields that they are they are spread over. Uh, the the essential thing is to maintain what we what the the populations we've got now, which is why I th I think um, it, it's it's crucial um, that the government should come up with some scheme uh, that can uh, reward farmers for cut 
cutting later or more slowly uh, on, on, on the small number of fields that hold these 500 pairs. We're not talking about something that would cover the whole of Southern England. We're, cover, we're talking about uh, specific targeted measures for fields, which I'm quite sure um, the, all the, the local groups we're talking about could identify now. We could now go and point to, uh, it wouldn't even be 500 fields because sometimes there were two or three pairs on, on, on one field. D special measures are needed for, uh, for, the, for the special fields that still hold curlews. We've seen how they've disappeared from the Cotswolds and from more intensively farmed areas. And uh, unless we're going to have them disappearing totally in, in, the, ne in the next 10 or 15 years, um, some, some method of rec recompensing farmers uh, for leaving areas uncut, or indeed even just buying their whole hay crop off them and saying, okay, don't uh, leave, the, leave those fields, cut them very late when the curlews have, have finished breeding and use, use that, that hay just for bedding and we will provide some sort of compensation. I mean, that, that's, the, that's the sort sort of thing that needs to happen if we're to preserve the, um, the, the small number of curlews left in lowland uh, England. Are these the kind of discussions that you are having in, in Natural England, Rebecca? Yeah, and I would, I would say that we, we do already have uh, some of the measures that, that Mike's outlined in, in terms of sort of having that, that later hay cut. Um, but I think it's, it's I, the knock-on impacts of what those later hay cuts then mean for the farmers and uh, whether they can get then get hay and, and make sure that they're compensated um, appropriately. I think what Pete said about sort of modern day uh, machinery and sort of the speed of, of which the um, fields are cut now, they, they do stand sort of quite little hope of, of, of being able to run away because they do hunker down. Um, so making sure that, that we talked about the sort of a package of measures for, for Carelew to, to have to give farmers that option um, and I guess the the backup uh, and um, the word confidence that they have something to rely on if they do end up having curly without sort of having the fear that they're going to either uh, lose money severely, or or the only other option is is to sort of munch up with the curly. Uh, so yeah, it's it's definitely something that we're we're working on. I know that uh, Russ and I have uh, been just talking with you, Rebecca, about um, about simplifying the whole system so that, and I think Pete mentioned it. You know that mm. there's this thing over here and this thing over here, and and oh, it's really confusing. Could we just simplify the system? And I, I, I know that's very easy to say, and I'm not in your shoes, and I'm very glad I'm not in your shoes. But I know you've been listening to that. Is, is that right, Pete? Something much simpler is is something that you would support. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, um, as as I've said previously, not every farmer wants to have a um, their farm in a whole farm agri environment scheme. Um, that might not be for you know any one reason it might just be you know that that's what they don't particularly want whereas if they they might well engage with um a prescription that just solely looks at the you know the, the conservation of curlews I, just, I think that would be you know a lot of farmers probably struggle with uh the the rules and regulations and even the implication of these big agri-environment schemes um Whereas if it was a simple, um, you know, prescription based around the, the preservation and protection of curlews, then the, they may well be, you know, more aligned with that and, and, and far more interested in seeing the success of that, I think. Yeah, I think one of, one of the things uh, that we haven't had enough of, and I think what I think Jeff has said and, and Natural England is really pushing, is, is to have more, more flexibility. Um, I think... The, what we're doing at the moment is within sort of that Elm um, countryside stewardship lens and would probably need to stay within that whether it's mid-tier or higher tier but like I said I want to have give farmers more um, freedom and more flexibility so they're not tied to that whole farm system so that that's 
the ambition, I guess, is is to to give them the flexibility. Do you think, Rebecca, that um, as someone's made a comment in 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 the chat here that you know just a few hundred pounds isn't going to do it? Do you think that seriously there's enough money in the system to allow to compensate farmers? Do you think there'll be enough? I uh, I don't have the figures. Uh, to hand, but I know that with the obviously with the withdrawal of, of the base BPS basic payment system, um, the actual level of funding for um, for higher tier and mid tier and, and uh, SFI has increased massively. Um, it, it's by an order of magnitude, I think. So there is a lot more money and investment going into um, agricultural schemes which are promoting uh, sort of biodiversity. Uh, values, so there will be money there, um, but I think it's it's testing um, how much money is actually needed uh, to be able to to yeah to see if it is an option. So it's kind of a bit of a uh, I'll, yeah, I'll come right to you, Mike. I'll just just a uh, probably an off the cuff suggestion here, Rebecca. But is there any called blended finance with private money that would help? Do you think has anyone thought about that option? I don't know if anyone's thought about blended finance. Uh, in my previous role, I, I was looking at, at sort of green green finance options because obviously there is a massive amount of of private private uh, money which is coming forward uh, through through different avenues, especially with things like biodiversity net gain. So I definitely think that it's something that we should be exploring more of if it's not being yeah. discussed already. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Sorry, Mike, I I cut you off. What was you? Yeah, I, I I just wanted to say you remember I showed that picture of the of the meadow with the um the rare plant in it the 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 water dropwort, um so if if you were if you had a curlew based scheme, uh, it would have a whole lot of uh, byproducts uh, that 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 would ca carry through so curlew would be the flagship uh, species. But it would help other ground nesting uh, birds as well. It would it would help uh, hay meadow uh, vegetation. Uh, it 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 would maintain um, the, the hay meadows uh, vegetation and and their invertebrate life. The invertebrates that almost nobody talks about this, and yet this is what the young curlews um, uh, thrive on. So it's really essential to. To, to have something that looks after that as well. So it, although you might call it just curlews, it would have all sorts of valuable knock-on biodiversity effects as well. Yeah, I think that's very good. And, and increasingly we have to think, uh, we're not thinking of single species, we're thinking of the whole package, you know, increasing nature in this country, farmland nature. And it just so happens that some species are sort of flying the flag, if you like, and curlew is one of them. But if you say the curly, my goodness, you you protect a lot of other things as well. Um, quite a few. Th there's a couple of questions before because we're all we're an hour already. Can you believe it? A couple of people have asked Pete and Mike. You might have a comment on this as well. Why can't you do more to attract the birds away from silage fields so that it's not an issue? I think um, I'll let I'll let uh, Mike respond to that first of all. Is it possible to tempt curlews to save for pastures? If only, if only. <laughs> um, uh, part of our project uh, has been to try to uh, mark birds with colour rings so you can recognise individuals. It means that uh, as soon as you're you're looking not just at an unidentified curlew, but you know that 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 that's well we. We, we put colour rings on our curlews and we, we christen them after the name of the farmer who, whose land they're on. So we have a, a Tim and a Carl and a Malcolm and a Stuart and others. Um, and one, one of the results of this colour marking um, shows just how incredibly sight faithful these birds are. They come back year after year, the same individual comes not just to the same general area, but to the same individual field. And we know that uh, in the winter when they're going around the coastlines, they're, they're going back to the same same spot on the dial all the time. So um, if you could, 
if you if you could increase the productivity of the young so that there were more curlews coming back to the same fields, they might spread a bit. But it really is um, a matter of looking after what 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 we've got, uh, uh, which is already diminishing. It, it's a really urgent thing. So um, I I, th I think it's it's really important to to try and maintain the ones we've got uh, and and to prevent this gradual decrease which which has happened um because of the um uh, the, the the indentification of agriculture do you, do you find that do the birds come back almost to the same dandelion each year or do they move around a bit more no i totally agree with mike there the, you know you can't you can't exactly go back to the same spot within the same field but they definitely do come within probably 100 or 200 meters of, of the same place each year um which, which is is nice to know because you know they're going to be there but uh, very frustrating when that's that field is is, is mown for silage every year which to some people who aren't farmers they might say well why don't you just choose another field to be a silage field um if, if only it was that easy, a bit like if it only is as easy as telling the curlews not to nest in a silage field. Um, <laughs> you know, you have certain fields on your farm that are, are suitable, whether that be uh, through through kind of soil type, whether some are wet or whether some are dry, uh, whether some are, are, are more undulated than others. Um, you know, so there's, there's many reasons that dictate whether it's a, a, a croppable field or not. Um, and unfortunately, the curlews you know, as, as well as picking fields that aren't cropped, they have a tendency to pick the ones that are as well, you know, much to our frustration. So that sort of kind of plays in, in, in our favour, really, in that we do know where the birds are going to be. Um, and so it is a matter of saying it's this area we need to protect. It's not as though it's random every year, which would probably make the, the problem a bit more difficult. Yeah. Um, there's a Mary, couple of questions. Something quickly. No, of course not. Yep. I'm just wondering about um, it, so the reliance on those birds coming into a relatively accurate area at least. What what does sort of profitability look like and sort of potential uh, changes to, to the systems if some areas were um, converted into, into hay meadows? So you were cutting for hay or at least haylage uh, instead of uh, silage. I'm going to ask Pete to answer that. And Pete, could you explain what someone asked what haylage is for non-farmers? What's the difference between hay, yeah. haylage and silage? I mean, that's a good question. So the three different forms of essentially conserved forage, um, hay being the oldest form um, in terms of it's been around for the longest, which is essentially just dried grass. So that's it's a fresh grass cut, uh, crop that's cut and then is dried for anywhere between four and maybe seven or eight days, depending on what the weather's like, and also depending on the type of grasses that there are. Um, and that's sh shaken out each day, sometimes a couple of times a day, and then, uh, and then baled up. Um, the next step up from that is haylage, which is, it's not fresh green grass and it's not dry grass. It's somewhere in between. So it's generally been wilted for probably 48, uh, 48 hours, two, you know, two, two and a half, three days. Uh, so it's still got a little bit of moisture in it. Hay will be sat at about 80% moisture, uh, sorry, 80% dry matter. Haylage will be sat around the kind of 50, 55, 60% dry matter. And then you have silage which, that we cut and we try to get our silage at 30% dry matter. So that's been cut and, and is siled in a clamp or in a bale um, after probably 36 hours of being wilted on, on, on the fields. Some people, uh, you know, will cut it and harvest it within 24 hours, but for us it's about 36 hours. And, and each of those different feed elements have, um, have different nu nutrient status, different feed value, um, different energy, different protein, different sugar levels, dry matter. All of these things are essential in making up a diet for a, a, the animal that's, that's going to consume it. I don't know if that helps, if I answered or, or not. Yeah, and on to Rebecca's question. Sorry, can you just remind me of that, Rebecca? Yeah, I mean, based on all, all of that, that really good summary of, of what you just said about the differences, what would be the impact, uh, knock on impact, or okay. if any, I think there would be, on, uh, on your uh, system if you were to convert some of the fields into to hay? 
ra or haylage rather than silage where you've got that later taking that later cut with the potential for the curly to be nesting in those possibly and hopefully sort of steering them towards the hay yeah. rather than the silage <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the, uh, <laughs> yeah. The, I mean, there would there would be a knock-on effect um, in, in many ways, really. Si simply um, put, the silage meadow that I'm stood in here, or the silage field that I'm stood in here, has modern grass varieties in it. Uh, the, the 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 species of grass that grow in here are there's a lot of perennial ryegrass. Um, there's there's Timothy, there's Coxfoot, there's some white clover they don't make good hay they're too they're too nutrient rich uh, they've got too much of a, a broad um, luscious leaf um, they would take a lot longer to dry and the type of hay that they would make wouldn't be very good um, the, the hay meadows that Mike was talking about earlier will be full of annual meadow grasses various different wildflowers um, they, they are in the crudest uh, terms, they, they, they are e quite easy to kill as in the sun dries them out very easily. So could we turn this hay meadow, this, sorry, this silage field to a hay meadow? We couldn't, not without uh, um, allowing the soil to regress over time and it would take a long time. You know, something like a pH, the pH in this field is probably six to 6.2. In the hay meadows Mike's talking about, they'll probably be about five to 5.2, you know, and so that would take years for the pH to drop, which would then would be the right environment um, for those those annual meadow grasses and the, and the plant species, the, the flower species to thrive. So that's not really that simple. In terms of what would it, what would it look like to the field if if we said two acres the field isn't isn't mown and is and you know we leave it as a standing crop that would be fine in the sense of it would continue growing and so if we then cut it maybe six weeks later so um uh, you, you know maybe when it comes into being cut for the second time you would end up having a two acre field a, a patch of the field that has essentially rank grass because rye grass just wants to go to seed as quickly as possible and then it it, it dies off and the, the feed quality of it would be you know it, it would be very very poor quality feed essentially we did that in this field last year as i say we had a nest that we found and we left the, this area uncut and you could see it even probably eight to ten weeks later the knock-on effect w was so negative in comparison to the rest of the field that was still growing you know, uh, copious amounts of grass. The, the what it had done to the grass plant, essentially, what the grass plant had done, has it gone to seed, which is what the perennial ryegrass wants to do, and then that's it. It stopped, it had reproduced, and it, then it didn't want to grow again. And so that area, that acre of, of land that we that we left, um, essentially grew a, a fraction of the amount of grass as the rest of the field. I could go into more detail around how grass plants weren't. I won't do that. That will get bore everybody. But you know that. <laughs> That's, that's essentially what we're saying is that the loss of production of dry matter, because we talk about grass and the way it grows in terms of dry matter and dry matter yields, would have a serious negative impact on the amount of dry matter that a field could grow. So that's where the compensation needs to come in, because rather than a field like this one grows 13 tonnes of dry matter per year per, per hectare, if you if you left a hectare uncut, for six to eight weeks longer than normal you would really impact the amount of uh, dry matter per hectare that that, that that area would grow okay and i think that's a, a really really useful explanation thanks pete and we heard a bit of a similar thing from the farmer on the last webinar who said um that he can tell a bad silage if he you know the next day in the milk if he's had a poor silage the cows had a poor silage feed it, it actually converts into lower quality uh, output of milk and I think that's something that most people I certainly didn't realize it was that sensitive so it's a real balancing act that you've got to do here all this that that we're hearing about Rebecca is th is this complexity all taken into account in the discussions you're having with DEFRA and setting the elms and the compensation level or do you think people like Pete and uh, Pete's colleagues could feed in more to what you're what you're doing Definitely. Um, I think there there has been sort of focus groups and discussions that DEFRA have had with 
with users of schemes uh, to sort of explore what's working, what's not working. I haven't personally been involved in those, but sort of DEF are releasing those. And I think there, there will be and there should be more as well to understand sort of the complexities. And like you said, those knock on impacts that are very small, well, a very large scale, but based on very small uh, percentages changes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's just so useful to, to hear the webinar a few weeks ago and then to be, speak to the likes of, of Pete to get those sort of personal experiences and to work out what the nuances are and, and to see if this is, yeah, if it is a, a goer. Um, I think that um, it certainly makes my head spin the complexity of all this and curlews, these sort of ground nesting birds with their very sort of ancient instincts, if you like, trying to survive in a in fields which are run by spreadsheets and equations and, and scientific sort of balancing act. And I wonder whether, you know, with 500 pairs left, as Mike said, we know that from the field work that Mike and others have done, that we have a pretty good reason in England that that sort of lowland, if you take a line sort of below Birmingham and put it out horizontally below that, we only have 500 pairs left. Whether realistically we can hold on to curlews, considering the demands that we're putting on lowland farmland, uh, the, the the sort of the, the imperative for farmers to make money. Um, do we think we're going to make it? Do you think that we are just sort of holding on to the last pairs? Or are there solutions out there considering the complexities that we've heard? I'm going to ask you, Mike, to comment on that. Um, I think it, what we're trying, to, what we're talking about here is trying to maintain curlews in a farmed landscape. Um, that is becoming increasingly difficult. Um, Rebecca referred to an NNR in the north. I, I'm sure she was talking about the, the Derwent, um, uh, where basically is, is farmed for, for curlews. And I, I, I would be, f yeah, already the curlews are, have been pushed in our area into, into these floodplain hay meadows, which are not really their natural habitat. They they hang on there, um, and unless unless there is huge support from um, uh, in financial terms for for these few places um, where they where they still survive, I can't I can't see them uh, lasting for a long time in in a farmed habitat. May, where you have a, a a, a particular reserve, and uh, and and the priority is looking after the the the, the biodiversity and the curlews. Um, maybe you could you could do it. It will be very difficult without some sort of outside finance um, to to maintain curlews in a farm landscape. I think. Yeah, and this is the uh, public money for public goods, of course. So, uh, which is. Uh, what we're supposed to be heading for. Pete, do you think you, you're going to hold on to your curlews? I, I would be stated, I would say, to think that we would lose them. Um, I mean, it's a shame that you guys can't hear what I can hear now. I mean, all around me are pairs of curlews um, courting, or however you put it, uh, in the birding world. Um, you know, I'm just I'm witnessing pairs in every direction, really, and I can hear their their song. And for me to lose that would be, you know, it, it'd be a failure. I would say, I would feel as if I failed as a farmer. Um, it's it's something that I remember from my childhood growing up in South Shropshire, um, and I know the area where I grew up have lost them. Um, and to think that we lose them, we could lose them here is, you know, it's a kind of, it's not, it, you know, it's not an unthinkable thing. I don't want it to happen, not in my time scale. I want my children to be able to appreciate them. Um, and, you know, I want other people to be able to appreciate them. You know, it's, whenever we have friends to stay, you know, I would say, I don't know if you can hear them. They're, 
they're all around me at the moment. Um, you know, whenever we're friends to stay, I, you know, I want them to come and hear these curlews because it's something that we should, uh, you know, members of the public should be able to hear and, and see. And, it, you know, um, because it's an amazing you know, sp um, sight and sound, really, to appreciate the curlew. So I hope it doesn't happen on my watch. Mm. Rebecca. I think I'm hopeful. I think they are a fantastic flagship, flagship species. I think Iris PB are for the, the top bird of, of concern at the moment. I think with the opportunity to to create a, a new scheme, uh, it started off quite slow, I'm honest, but um, we sort of now picked up pace. And now there's this massive opportunity, which I'm very, very happy to be involved in, to create something for these key priority and threatened species. So through, I think, through collaborative conversations like this uh, with people that are out on the ground, conserving them, managing uh, farms, I, I am hopeful that we can create something um, that that does help to, to save care. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm going to stay optimistic. I'm delighted to hear that. And of course, always any sort of farming regime, any any prescriptions have to go alongside everything else. So it's not just a matter of not mowing later. We also have to consider all the other things that impact on curlews as well. Uh, somebody mentioned rolling and harrowing that goes on. It's not just the cutting. It's all the farming practice right from the first days that always has an impact on the birds as well, rolling and harrowing. So there's a lot to do, but um, I, I've found this session really interesting and uh, thank you for your very moving sort of plea for the curlew, both Mike and Pete. And thank you for Rebecca for stepping into the fray and, and being the face of Natural England in, in what is a, just such a complicated and difficult situation. We, I know because we talk about it a lot. Um, you know, the, the policy can sound dry and dull and, and not very interesting. You know, I want to be out there with the birds, but it's you guys that are going to make the difference. It's you listening to people like Pete and Mike and coming up with the solutions for birds. That, that's the only way over a landscape scale that will hold on to birds. So I want to thank you for coming tonight, Rebecca. Thank you, Pete, for showing us the farm. I wish we could hear it. I can't hear it, but boy, do I wish I was standing next to you. Uh, it was about just a year or so ago we came up to see you on your farm and the birds were just arriving back and then it was it's just magical. And and Mike, right. yeah, it was great. And Mike, thanks for everything you do for the birds in Gloucestershire and I shall be out you know, hot on your tail quite soon. Thank you, everyone. Um, please uh, continue to sort of interact with Curlew Action. Um, please donate if you can to keep us going. And uh, thank you for this follow on question and answer webinar. I hope it's made some a bit clearer some of the very complicated issues around curly conservation. When I first got involved in curly conservation, I thought it was just a matter of just tweaking a bit around the edges and everything would be fine. I couldn't have been more wrong, but we've got good people out there putting all their brains to helping. So I'm going to join with you, Rebecca, and say I hope we can. Thanks ever so much, everybody, on behalf of Curlew Action for taking part tonight and for the audience for, for joining in. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. -bye.